cheeseburgers for everybody. It's a sweep. Hey everybody, it's Chuck Garfine. Welcome to the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust. I'm here in the virtual podcast studio powered by Points Bet. Well, Jake Berger's comeback continues to amaze us. It's a baseball story straight out of Hollywood. In fact, we're watching two of these Hollywood stories simultaneously with the White Sox. Liam Hendricks, who's coming back from cancer. And Sunday, he pitched a perfect ninth inning for his first win of the season. And in the same game, there was Jake, who hit that walk-off grand slam in the bottom of the ninth to give the White Sox a dramatic sweep over the Tigers. When the White Sox drafted Jake Berger in the first round in 2017, Nick Hostelder was the team's scouting director. He's been there with Jake through the ups and downs. And on the podcast, I speak with Nick about Jake's comeback story. And what a story it is. And there are many more chapters to come. It's coming your way. Okay, joined by Nick Hostetler. And, you know, Nick, you go way back with Jake Berger. What has it been like to see him flourish like this after all he's been through, gone through? It's been... more than anything, I can say it's been reward. It's it's rewarding from the standpoint of looking at it through the lens for for Jake. Um, you know, for me, uh, for us as the organization, I think we're just we just enjoy the successes and the excitement, all of it, regardless of of what player it is. But with Jake knowing all he's been through, um, both physically, mentally, uh, professionally, and to see see him to be able to come out on that other side bigger, better than, than ever before uh, is something that's, I mean, it's extremely rewarding uh, for Jake and for Ashlyn. And I mean, his son Brooks doesn't know it yet, but uh, it's going to be a pretty cool story for him to, to hear when he gets older, but to see the success he's having is, is it's so exciting. There are people in Hollywood who are trying to write movies like this and he's living this kind of life, right? Isn't this straight out of a Hollywood movie, the comeback he's made? It absolutely is. And, you know, and I I think that, I mean, our team in general this year has had a few of those with Liam and the, and, and, and things like that. So, I mean, I think this is maybe a, maybe a pretty good storybook that, uh, yeah, there's, I I could imagine that later down the road that, you know, they got the, the rookie from Jim Morris and that movie was made and all that. Maybe we see a, a Jake Berger movie at some point. So you draft him, you guys, you were the scouting director, but you guys as a team drafted, drafted Jake Berger in 2017, first round, 11th overall. You did a lot of research on him, and you're obviously doing a lot of homework on him to see what kind of player, what kind of person he is. Did you, I mean, how deep down did you imagine who Jake Berger could be, and did you ever think he could be this? You know, I, I think we're, yeah, I, I mean, to say, any time that we make a pick, especially in the first round, um, we obviously hope that they have the success that he's currently having. Um, to sit here and say that we would knew that he could endure two Achilles injuries, a, a mental health battle, and all of those things, like, no. I, I mean, I don't know if you ever know um, that, you know, makeup is such an important part of the of the evaluation process. But at the same time, you can have the greatest makeup in the world if you don't have tools to actually play the game and be good at it. Um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter how great the makeup is. Uh, tools at the end of the day rule it. And you know, when we Clay Overcash at the time was our area scout, and Clay is now the assistant coach at the University of Oklahoma. Um, he talked very highly of Jake. And when we started digging into Jake, uh, his time at Team USA, the stuff with Coach Guyton at, at Missouri State. Um, myself and our Midwest cross checker at the time, Garrett Guest, went and met with Jake prior to um, it had been prior to the conference tournament. And when we sat down in the room, we talked to one of their student assistants at the time, and he told us a story. And I, and I was thinking about this when you texted me yesterday about about talking about this. I was thinking about the story. 
he told Garrett and I a story about, I want to say it was mono J cat. He was sick and they were painting the batting cages at Missouri state, the, the new facility they just put up. And even though he was sick, still came in with his teammates. They actually had to send him home because they were worried about him getting everybody else sick. Um, you know, I, I think I even said this when we drafted him, he brought us bottles of water, you know, stuff like that. He just is a good human being. And and I think that was the one thing when Garrett and I left there, we came out away a with is this guy's just a good, solid person. Um, you know, I don't know if you can ever, <laughs> I know you can't, you can't ever foresee what's going to happen in the future or what somebody's going to have to deal with um, off the field or with injuries or whatever it may be. Um, but that's a pretty good foundation being the person that we came away feeling Jake was. And after those meetings um, that we really thought that, you know, he could, he blended in with the tools plus the makeup to, to have that success. I, I think as this, after that conference tournament, Jim Tomey went in, got a chance to talk with him. Uh, Buddy Bell, I think had a chance to meet with him as well. And, and those are the types of, you know, they came away with the same feeling that um, Garrett and I had, and I had when we left there and, uh, when you can put all those pieces together, uh, combined with your evaluations, your data, your analytics and everything, th those puzzle pieces fit together, you feel really good about the selection at the time. So, um, you know, walking out of that draft room in 2017, we felt, and I think I said it at the time, we felt we got the best right-handed power in the country. Um, Might have been an odd path to get there, but I think he's shown that, you know, he does have that, that right-handed power that we expected back at Missouri State. So he gets drafted by you guys in 2017. I remember 2018, spring training, he gets invited to big league camp. He had a locker in there with the White Sox. He was just beaming and played in some games, showed the promise, and then he tears his Achilles during a game. And I remember you telling me a story about how you went in there because you were there, right? You were in Glendale when this happened. Yeah. What did he say to you when, I mean, tears his Achilles – He's in the trainer's room and you see him and he should be and probably was devastated. But what did he tell you? He looked right at me and said he was sorry. And uh, I mean, thinking back to that day, I was standing up in the in the suite with Rick and Kenny and we were watching the game. And I mean, I kind of get a little emotional right now just talking about it. Um, he took the swing, made good, hard, solid contact like he normally does. Uh, ball comes off his bat and you're expecting to look up and see him rounding first heading second and you look up and he's nowhere to be found you, you look down and you see him laying on the ground arriving in pain and um i can remember a couple of choice words that were said in the box um in the suite when 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 we looked down and saw it happen um and i think the realization really hit when we saw the cart came out um you know he didn't get up he didn't wasn't able to walk it off and um when he got put on the cart and went back you know, my mom, I, I don't remember what I did from the time I walked out of the suite or even what I said to Kenny or Rick until I got to um, the training room and I walked in the training room and um, I just walked up to him, put my hand on his back. He was laying face down and just looked right up to me and said, I'm sorry. And, you know, and that's I mean, that's that's Jake in a nutshell. I mean, he he's so he's so compassionate and caring that the first thing he thought about was, was the White Sox and the, the organization. Um, you know, Rick came right in afterwards um, and talked to him and, you know, and to see how heartbroken he was at that point, but at the same time, just how much he truly cared about the organization. Um, and one of the most probably painful things he's ever dealt with was, was unbelievable. So that, that day, while, <laughs> while as painful and as upsetting as it was, I think at the same time, it was, uh, it, it, it kind of showed his true character and who he is as a person. And that was only the beginning, yeah. which is just crazy. He tears the Achilles again, three months later, yeah. has heel issues, has, there was another injury that he had. Um, yeah. I can't remember what it was. But then he's dealing with anxiety and depression and PTSD. You and you were staying in touch with him during his darkest moments that you can share. I mean, how bad was it? Do you think for him? I think it was tough. Um, I think there's a few things out of this that, while obviously we are seeing the silver lining and all of it, we're seeing the the fairy tale story uh, right now unfolding um, in 2023. 
But to see what he went through um, during that time, one as a probably as a as humanity is and uh, where we're at now as a world, like people need to really understand that you never know what people are going through. Um, you don't know what they're dealing with on a day to day basis. You don't know those things. And, and all of the what he was going through day to day, um, we had people, um, Chris Getz and our player development staff, all of our guys, all of our medical staff, um, what they did and the plan of action and the course of action that they took place right away and hit the ground running with Jake and did gave him any piece of support um, ability to just to talk or to set up the plans to get him back rolling the virtual reality stuff that he did, all of the things that happened. Um, our player development staff and our medical staff doesn't get nearly enough credit as what they should um, publicly for what Jake to, to getting Jake back to this point. I know Jake is, is as appreciative as anybody about it. And you talk to him, that's the first thing he's going to mention, but what Chris Getz and their staff did. And, and I know Getsy himself personally spending time with Jake, um, talking with Jake, just, just trying to help him through this. Um, you know, we've got to remember these are human beings and, you know, the, all of these players are, we're, they're not robots as much as we'd love for them to be robots and be able to just press a button and they perform exactly like we thought they would, or, um, they're able to overcome an injury like that or whatever. There's human emotion. Um, there's the mental side of it that comes into play that, you know, all of us deal with on a daily basis, but unfortunately for them, theirs is so public, you know, I can do it behind closed doors if I'm having a bad day. Um, you know, Jake Berger can't, his is out there publicly every day. So, um, you know, to, to, to talk with him and, and, to, you know, keep in touch with him to let him know that we loved him, you know, and I think that's the big thing. Like, Getsy and the player development staff and our medical staff just kept telling them, you know, we love you. Like, we're you're out, you're one of us. You're part of us. And um, they did everything they possibly could, you know, to keep that positivity. Because at that point, that was what he needed more than anything: is a positive reassurance of knowing that, hey, there are people here that love and care for you. Um, it was very easy for that point. If Jake wanted to just walk away, he had his money. Um, he could have walked away, had a really nice life, and live the rest of his life. Nobody had to worry about it. Um, that's not him. And that's not what, you know, that's not the the heart, the soul, the effort that, that Jake has. It's not what our player development staff has, not what our medical staff has. And everything they put into that is, is a true testament of what that, what the White Sox have here and how they can help, you know, help people like Jake in those situations. So when he has a game like he had on Sunday, hits a walk-off grand slam. How did you find out about it? Were you watching the game? Did you hear about the game? What was your reaction when you found out that he had a moment like that? It probably is not the best thing to say if Rick hears this, but I, I, I do a lot of times I either have the game on my headphones at the game I'm at, or I'm watching the game on my phone. Um, and I, I was, I was in the stadium uh, getting ready for my game and and it may have just started. I don't really, I think it was over, but I was in the press room and, uh, I heard it and I heard Len's call on it. And uh, I mean, it's just to hear the shriek in Len's voice, it kind of made it even better. But I mean, it, it, it just, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's awesome. I can still remember last year when last year, two years, whenever Jake hit his first home run, mm -hmm. um, I was in St. Louis walking back to the hotel and um, he hit it and Rick sent me a text and I actually tripped walking back on the street. Cause I was reading the text, but didn't even wasn't embarrassed at all. Could care less that forty thousand people outside of Cardinal Stadium, Bush Stadium, saw me trip. Um, didn't care uh, because it was it was so exciting. But you know, for those things to happen, um, you know, and to see this just continuing, and hopefully this is just the start of it. You know, this is just the start of it, and there's so many more chapters of this to be written. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool to to hear Len Casper, or Jason Benetti, or whoever it may be. Um, you know, scream that it's a grand slam and he just won the game. Pardon the expression, but one thing that I've been looking for, I've been wanting to see more of from the team and it has to do with burger is hunger, right? <laughs> and where's the hunger? Where's the hunger? The will to win as uh Hawk Harrelson uh, coined the phrase TW, TW. He seems to be loaded with it, right? He's loaded with the hunger, right? 
Yeah, I think he appreciates everything. All that he's been through, um, I think, gives you a different sense. I think you asked him, he would say it gives you a different sense of appreciation. Um, you know, I think we always tell our kids and players and whoever it may be that you never know when the game or whatever you're doing is going to be taken away from you. It could be taken away in a, in a drop of a hat. He's experienced that um, where it was taken away from him. And in many, I mean, there's very few that come back from that. You know, I mean, there's very few, I, you don't hear a whole lot of, uh, of Achilles tear, Achilles tears, uh, success stories. You know, I think we all hear Kobe, um, you know, but Kobe only had one, you know, this kid had two, um, you know, and, and so he had it taken away from him and, and probably, I mean, I, I, I've not asked Jake this and, and something I'll probably ask him when his career is over, but you know, I, I, he probably thought it was, it was done. He probably thought he was finished. And, um, to, to not only be able to come back and play the game, uh, but to be able to play at such a high level um, is something that, you know, I, 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 I think that that in itself drives that passion, that will to win or that, that hunger um, that you see from him. I think, I think that's it. And, you know, and that things, that type of personality and that type of, of want is contagious. And the more that that person's around, you start having a few more guys like that, a few more like that. And all of a sudden that thing just keeps building. The train keeps going on that tracks and you don't want to be in the way when that thing gets moving. So, you know, I think those are the, the those types of things and that personality, it can be contagious. Hey, coming up more of my conversation with Nick Hostetler, but first huddle up because it's time to feel the power with points bet with the points bet power hour. You can get boosted odds or bonus bets every single day whether you're into hoops or hockey home runs or hole-in-ones the power is in your hands and new customers will receive up to one thousand dollars of second chance bets that's 10 straight days of second chances where points bet will match your losing wager in bonus bets download the points bet app today using the code chai talk 10 points bet your move when the white Sox drafted him and i met him i said to myself assuming he can get to the major leagues because there's no guarantee, especially like baseball. I mean, first round picks, I mean, even first round picks have tough times getting to the major leagues. I remember really vividly remember saying to myself, if he can just get to the major leagues, this is the kind of guy who can lead a team. Mm -hmm. Like Ozzy Guillen was probably the worst hitter on all the teams he was in, but he was the leader in the clubhouse. Right. Jake has that, right? He does. He does. He's got that infectious personality. I mean, just, and he's not afraid to be himself. And I think that's one of the coolest things to see. Jake Berger, who you see on TV and doing interviews and do that, is the same Jake Berger that Garrett and I met that day in, in Missouri State. He's no different. There's not a, and I can say that for a lot of our, and Gavin Sheets the same way, yeah. Andrew Vaughn's the same way. I mean, they are, and Jake, Jake's the epitome of that. He is who he is. And he doesn't try to be anything more. He doesn't shy away from, from anything. He's not trying to be the big flashy guy with, you know, you don't, I would never, I would be fully shocked if I ever saw Jake drive up in a sports car to a game, you know, it's just not him. He's just real. And, and I think that in itself, and, and I, we're in a world of social media where there is a lot of fake, there is a lot of um, people representing what they're not and who they truly aren't, that's not Jake. Jake is the same guy that now as he was that Garrett and I met in, in 2017 at, in Missouri State. Um, he's not going to show up in a sport. Like I said, he's not going to show up in a sports car. Um, I, I would be blown away if he ever did. Um, it's just not who he is. And, and, you know, and I think that the older we get and the more people we're around, we see that, you know, that is a quality uh, of authenticity, real and just truth that um, there's not a lot of people out there like that. And, and Jake is that way. When you scouted him, did you see the speed? Did you see what he was capable of on the base paths? Like we are seeing here in 2023. You know what I mentioned last night in that text thread that I had with those three that I was Coming on your those podcast. three, by the way, those three are uh, Andrew Vaughn, Gavin Sheets, Jake Berger. Yeah, I mentioned that I was coming on your podcast today, and I said I fully expected to be asked about Jake's sprint speed, 
where Jake quickly point out that baseball savant said he's the third fastest guy on our team. Andrew was quick to point out that he has the same career stolen bases as Jake. Um, to answer your question in regards to did we see it in 2017, not to the extent that we're seeing now. Um, he was deceptive, deceptively quick um, and fast. He was a better athlete than he looked. Um, and, and a lot of our guys that saw him um, made those comments. I remember Garrett, uh, Mike Shirley mentioned it as well. They mentioned he was he was quicker and more agile than you would think he would be just by looking at him. Um, it was more of a short, choppy steps out of the box. It was a little bit unorthodox. Um, it wasn't your normal speed burner, number three, uh, fastest guy on the team look. Um, so to say that we saw what we're seeing now, no. Uh, but there was a little bit of, there was some speed there and there was some athletic ability there that I think that was better than, than maybe what the, the eye would think by just looking at him. Yeah. He's third. According to baseball savant, it goes Romy Gonzalez, Luis Robert, Jake Berger. And yeah, we've shown that on the pre and post game shows a few times that it's, it's, I do it for me. I do it for the show. I also do it for Jake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He is. He but, loves it. I can tell you that. Yeah, I'm sure he's, he's he's quick to remind everybody. But you know what I see? I see the will. I see the right. hunger. I see right. the speed. Like there is the speed, but then you just look at his whole body. He's running with all his might, all his being, and I think right. that puts him up several notches because he's got that, and not everyone does. Right, and that's you know, and that also goes back to our medical staff and our player development staff. That you know, they they the, the he nailed the rehab, he put in the work. Um, the rehab program that they set forth and put together is, was awesome. Um, you know, I, I think I referenced this in some other place where they, they mentioned about Jake's sprint speed. And I said, you know, it's kind of like the guys coming back from Tommy John that throw harder. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you got to nail the rehab and you got to put in yeah. the work. And, and our medical staff put in a great, had a great program set for him. The player development staff had an awesome plan. You know what I mean? COVID was mixed in there as well. You know, and he, they had to, get him at bats. I mean, he played in the men's league or whatever that was uh, in St. Louis there for a little while. And into our, into Chris Getz's credit, he allowed him to do it. You know, he had the foresight and the ability to see the forest through the trees in the situation to where he was allowed Jake to play in that, to get those at bats, to gain, to gain that confidence back without having the surrounding pressure of it being at our, our, uh, whatever they call that satellite camp, or whatever they called it. It was the camp. alternate site during COVID. That's it. So, I mean, Chris had the foresight to put the, to allow him to go do those things. Uh, and, you know, to take a guy that you invested millions of dollars in and say, yeah, it's okay for you to go play over here and somewhere else. Like that takes a lot of guts to do. Um, so them having the ability to do that. And then the medical staff's program, uh, you know, with the rehab and then Jake putting in the work and pounding it. I mean, yeah, like he did increase his sprint speed. He's faster than what we ever thought he was going to be. I'll say that. And, I, I never thought I'd see him hitting triples, um, scoring from first base, you know, on a double and hitting it. And I can't tell you I don't sit here every now and then and hold my breath when I see him running. And, I mean, I think it's human nature. Um, you know, but at the same time, like, to see it and then to see the smile on his face afterwards, like, again, like, how can you not love baseball? <laughs> so the name of that league that he joined, I think it was called, like, the Car Shield League in okay. St. Louis, something like that. And when I saw him, because he was not invited to the, you know, the White Sox alternate site, he had to find a place to get at bats in the height of COVID. And when I saw him doing that, I thought of two things. One, boy, he really, really, really wants it. Mm -hmm. And two, he may never amount to anything because right. this is where things have taken him. Mm -hmm. So for him to get through that, get all the way that low – and now he's here. He's on the all-star ballot. Yeah. He's on the all-star ballot. And he honestly, he should be getting a lot of votes because I just looked at it today. Of all the American League players, then you can now vote for a DH. Of all the players on the ballot for DH, he's got the highest OPS of everybody. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, it, it really is. And, you know, and it's one of those that, you know, and it, it, I, I think we're going to continue to see 
the improvements made, you know, and I, you see video and I see stuff on Twitter or talking to Rick hearing that, you know, Eddie's working him out at third or at second base and to see the different things that he's willing to do. I mean, this is a guy that is, he's, he's truly selfless. And I mean, and that, that goes for, you know, a lot of our team and the way that these, these young guys have meshed in and they've done just such a great job of, of just, Hey, I'll do it. You know, give me the opportunity. Let me get at the plate. I'll, I'll figure the rest out. And, you know, to see to see the success that he is having by going through, you know, like you said, he was in the car shield lead and Gavin Sheets wasn't at our alternate site and those types of things. And to see those guys have the ability to have the, the toughness and the fight in them to say, no, I'm not just going to settle. Um, you know, they work for what they've gotten. And I think that's what makes it so much sweeter with Jake is absolutely nothing was handed to Jake Berger. Um, there wasn't a hey, you get called up because you're a first rounder or you'll get your cup of coffee, nothing. I mean, he has had to put in the work, um, you know, and while while in the if they ever make a movie and I'm not sure who would play him, um, I'm sure he'd have you. Yeah, well, that ain't going to happen. You don't want to see me in a uniform anytime soon. Um, But, you know, I I I will tell you what, I, I think. Ultimately, it comes down to who Jake Berger is as a person. And the and, and it shows the work and the want that he has um, by what we're seeing right now. And and I don't think this is it. I think that you know these things are going to continue. He's going to continue to get better. He's not one to rest. I mean, I think we know that now. He's not. He had every opportunity in his life to just say, "I'm good. I'm good. Um, you know, been a good ride. I'm going to go. I'm going to hang out here in St. Louis and coach ball or do whatever." But not not him, you know, and, and I think we're seeing that right now. Yeah, you said nothing has been handed to him even this year. First yeah. round pick, obviously, didn't make the team. He was in AAA to start the season. Yeah. Well, even when we drafted him, I mean, when we drafted him, I mean, we you, we were looking for every reason not to, not just him. I mean, it's just the process that we go through. But there are so many other guys that we had discussions about at that pick. Um, that either went before us, went behind us, went right around where he was at, that we're all in the mix up until the point that we actually called his name. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I think he more than anything showed us that, um, and I think he continues to do it this day, that, you know, I, when you when you get something right and, you're, and you, you feel good about it and you feel that he, my gut tells me that this is the right thing, you know, stick with it and and – you've got a chance to come out on the other end uh, feeling good about it. So you look back at that 2017 draft and I hadn't really looked back at it in at least a couple of years. So this morning I'm looking, uh, you guys ended up doing better than probably any other team as I'm looking at this. So Jake gets drafted 11th. The Phillies took Adam Hazley, by the way, eighth, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but just now yeah. is you see Hazley's on the White Sox and he's actually and we like that a lot, what, yeah, what's that? Good. We liked Adam a lot in that draft. Yeah. You know, he was a guy we spent a lot of time on. And I could see why you did. Lefty, yeah. bat, I mean, outfielder. Like, at the time, you guys needed that, right? Sure, sure. Um, the Cubs took Alex Lang 30th. And ironically, Jake Berger hit the grand slam off of Lang on right. Sunday. And by the way, Lang had given up three runs all season. Jake drives in four with one He's swing of the nasty. bat. He has been nasty. Oh. Yes. But while we're watching the game, I'm on the set with Ozzy and it was, it was obvious to everybody, but Ozzy caught it very, very early. He's like, he doesn't have his stuff today. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have his stuff today. And that when you, <laughs> the door was open and <laughs> you got, we got to execute and they did. So the Cubs traded him to the Tigers for Nick Castellanos. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at, there's, there's a lot of swings and misses in that draft. And you got Gavin Sheets on top of it at 49. So you got two of the best players in the draft looking back on that. How does that yeah, make you knowing that? It feels good. I, I'm, and, and this is part of also part of the draft process that I think is also – it's fickle in the fact that, you know, probably a year ago you look back on that and you think, boy, did they whiff. You know, Nick was – Nick, well, he's lost his dig on mine, you know, in that draft, drafting those guys because they stink, you know. So, um, you know, it's, it's – again, I it takes time. And, you know, and I think we're – Fortunately, we're living in a society in a world right now where it's, it's everything's got to be instant. You know, these guys got to be drafted, got to get them right to the big leagues. Um, NFL, if they're not 
all pro pro bowlers winning Super Bowls in the first year, like something's wrong with them. NBA, like they're not rotation guys or they're not superstars. They're out. And we're dealing with it in baseball right now. Now, guys like Mike Trout and guys like those types of guys that have been drafted and move quick and get to the big leagues right away, Bobby Witts and those type of guys, like they've ruined it for pretty much everybody else um, because the development part of it is different now than what it was five, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, 10 years ago, if a guy got, the guy's path was level to level, A ball, double A, triple A, big leagues. If he got there in four years, it was like, wow, like this guy's really special. Um, now, if they're not there in a year and a half, people are saying they're a bust, um, which is not fair. It's not fair to these guys because guys just develop at different different phases of their life. I mean, Andrew Vaughn, I, I don't think he had a, a bat over, what was it, A ball, high yeah. A, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, guys just take to Gavin Sheets took more time. You know, the, some guys just they take more time. Now, Jake's thing was obviously very different because it was injury related. Um you know, and then you look at a guy like Gordon Beckham, who, you know, drafting, boom, and he's right there. He's right there in the big leagues. Was he ready? I don't know. I mean, you, you know, you ask Gordon, who knows? Um, no, I've talked to him about it a lot. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he's very open to, especially now, he's like an open book. And because he, because of what he went through. Right. And he'll be the first to tell you, no, he was not ready. He didn't understand failure. Sure. He never sure. dealt with slumps. And so sure. now you're slumping as a first round pick in the big leagues. Yeah. And it's with all the pressure and the spotlight in a market like Chicago, and it was not a recipe for success for him. Yeah. And you're on TV every day. You know, everybody sees every at bat, you know, back when Gordon was drafted in 2008, like I'm Canapolis intimidators weren't broadcasted, you know, and and (laughs) that didn't really start until we went through our rebuild and they started putting stuff on NBC Chicago and everything. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it did, you know, those guys had an opportunity to do it without having the spotlight on them every at bat, you know, and, and they could make adjustments. They could take time. And that's why it's so hard for what Chris and his staff's doing right now, because it's it's become such a huge thing in the public eye. You know, every at bat that uh, Colson Montgomery gets or every pitch that Noah Schultz throws or, you know, anything is, is under scrutiny. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these guys just take these kids take time and. A lot of them are adjusting just to life different. You know, it's different. It's way different playing in Kannapolis than it would be playing at Arkansas, you know, or Alabama or UCLA, let alone a high school kid. Um, you know, playing from southern Indiana or wherever you are to going and playing in, in Winston-Salem is, is is hard. It's different. And, you know, these guys just take different different paths. There's different, and that's one of the great things about baseball is that, everybody that are playing on the TV league uh, um, in the show, they've all taken different paths to get there. Nobody's is the exact same. And, you know, and I think, you know, obviously Jake's the perfect example of that. You know, his, his is going to be a very unique, uh, you know, I think Mike Soraka is the other one and, you know, he's a pitcher. Um, So, I mean, it's a little bit different than playing every day. So there's just so many different paths and avenues guys can take to get there. And, And the big thing is, it's hard for all of us. Trust me, I get it. But time and patience is key. No, I'm thinking about even myself because, okay, of course, now you're you get drafted. You're playing in these, um, you know, in the minors. You can't lay in the weeds like you used to be able right. to do that. That was the case with me and being a sportscaster. Mm-hmm. I my first job was in Traverse City, Michigan. Nobody was watching <laughs> except people in Traverse City. Right. So I could make all the mistakes and be terrible. And there was no one else watching, just people in Northern Michigan. But now everyone, I mean, you could be in Australia and you can watch the Kannapolis Intimidators, or now they're called the, the Cannonballers. So yeah. it's, it's times have changed in many ways, but definitely for baseball players, because the hardest thing to do in sports is hit a baseball and now to try doing that with all the pressure. Yeah, no, it is. And, and, and I mean, you've, you've hit it in the, the nail on the head, you know, in your profession. I mean, it is. It's like, and now, no matter, you could say something at 9.55 p.m. And at 9.56, it's on Twitter. And it's got 150,000 re- retweets. And all of a sudden, you're viral. And you're on the, the Today Show tomorrow morning. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's just so many different things that, you know, we live in a different world and society that, you know, is it's it is about instant gratification. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I think to have guys like Jake 
show the perseverance. And, and it's not just, I mean, obviously we're talking about Jake in this, but Keenan Middleton's and the Santos's and the other guy, I mean, it is about perseverance. Michael Kopech, I mean, all those guys, mm. like they've battled, they've fought, they've had to fight through their own. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier. We all have our own stuff in life going on. Um, fortunately for me, and not even as much as you, because you're in the public eye every day, but fortunately for me, I can do it behind closed doors. Um, those guys can't, you know, it's all public. Your stuff's public. I mean, it just, it's, 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 everything's at the fingertips and to see guys show that have that fight and that drive and that will to not say that I'm done, you know, mm -hmm. to say that, no, I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep fighting through this, you know, regardless of the situation, um, you know, it's, it makes it even sweeter. Yeah. We're all human beings. Uh, have you uh, gotten emotional watching Jake succeed? Absolutely. I have. Um, absolutely. I have come choked up. I mean, we, we started this just talking about that day in, in spring training got me choked up. Um, <laughs> it, it's exciting. It's um, it's emotional. It's um, I mean, I can't sit here and tell you that I haven't been brought to tears at times. Um, you know, I, I have, um, you know, there's been times where I've absolutely lost it watching him have this success. Um, you know, look like a blubbering idiot crying like crazy. Um just because I'm so I'm so happy for who he is as a person and to see him. I mean, there's times where I'll look and see on his Instagram, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to say that the look was good when he looked like when he dressed up as Shrek for Halloween with his wife and his dog. But um, Ashlyn definitely made it look better. But he, you know, even seeing that and seeing how happy he is, um, you know, just knowing where he came from and what he fought through. I mean, I can't imagine the feeling that his mother and father have um, seeing that. I mean, it just it is it is emotional and it is something that I have no problem saying that bawled my eyes out whenever I was watching a game and he hit a home run. And, you know, he's, he's bouncing around the bases. He's happy. And, you know, it's, it just is. I mean, it's you can't not be happy for the guy and excited. And, and to do it all again, still at such a young age, he's got so much time ahead of him um there's so much more to accomplish and there's so many more chapters to be written in the book of jake Berger that i mean we've only scratched the surface here so and i'm not just talking about a baseball player i'm talking about as a person and you know to see to see the success and to see where he is right now um you can't not get if you don't get emotional about it you're not a, you're not a human being yeah we do our picks to click uh, for every pregame show. Like, choose who you want for your pick to click. Every time he's in the lineup, I want to choose him. <laughs> and I'm like, right, I, can't, I can't keep choosing Jake Berger. But every time he's in the lineup, I'm like, I really want to take Jake. But I took him the last three games. I can't do it again. Hey, but I mean, again, like you saw it yesterday. I mean, he had, what, three strikeouts? And he drew the big walk in the, in, what was it, the ninth, I think it was. And um, or was maybe the eighth, whenever it was. Yeah. He drew the walk and and. You know, and it was like he said three strikeouts, but what that guy's been through, three strikeouts in a game, it is irrelevant to him because that last at bat he comes up, hits a grand slam, game over, you know, and against a guy that has been filthy against us each outing he had had. So, um, yeah, I mean, I keep picking him to click and hope you keep getting right with it. <laughs> well, here's what happened Ozzy took him Sunday. Okay. And you'll never hear I was the end winning. of it. I was winning because I had Eloy, and Eloy was, I think, like two for four with an RBI. And he steps up to the plate, Jake does, with the bases loaded. And Ozzy goes, I can win if he hits a home run here. If he hits a home run, grand slam, then I win. And sure enough, like 10 seconds later, boom, gone, game over. <laughs> You're never going to hear the end of it either because Ozzy no. doesn't break it all at all. No, to, no. I'm sure. By the way, and, and we'll wrap this up, the greatest pick-to-click uh, of all time. It'll never be ever, 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 ever be topped. There was a game two years ago when Sebi Zavala went like 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. Just a terrible game by him. On just, It was more than just that. I can't remember all the specifics, but he had a really, really, really bad game. Next day, Ozzy comes in. He goes, I'm choosing Sebi as my pick to click. And he hit three home runs. I remember the game. Yep. <laughs> Hey, he seen it. He saw it, right? He saw it and visioned it and night before. And then he uh, came in the next day and he threw, threw out his cards to you. <laughs>
So good. Well, hey, uh, thanks for spending time with me and talking about certainly one of my favorite people in the game. And I'm, I'm assuming one of yours as well. Absolutely is. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Enjoy it. And, uh, it was great catching up. Okay. And that is a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to the special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.